DTLA. <laughs> Sleeping on Chicago, man. Oh yeah. We live. How you been? Man, been good, man. Working hard, man. Good good to catch up with you. Been a minute. How you been? I see. Uh still doing my thing. Everything's wonderful. Um I'm always online paying attention to activity. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I was extremely shocked to see your name tied to some of this most recent content that reached the internet. Before we get off into that though. Could you tell me about um, Breakbeat Media? I remember you introduced it to me when it was in its infancy stages. Absolutely. It's taken, it's taken shape now, but yeah. Tell me about the Breakbeat Media. Um, you know, Breakbeat is uh, a platform that I'm um, building um, that is um, designed to be, you know, an authentic home for the hip hop community across generations, you know, whether you're 18, 21, or 8, 51, if you've grown up on hip hop, now you might not like the same music as each other these days. And that's how they've divided us through that music of, oh, this ain't real hip hop and the back and the forth. But if you've grown up on hip hop, you have way more in common the way you feel about what's going on in this world, the things you experience than with people who didn't grow up on hip hop across those same ages. So um, ultimately what Breakbeat is about is bringing that authentic voice, that authentic content, creating a platform that the, the community can trust similar to what the source represented for the hip hop community for, for many years in the you know, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Um, and, uh, you know, being a place where uh, new voices can be heard, you know, like some of the, the talent that I brought in to launch Breakbeat are kind of what I, I would call like my unsigned hypes of Breakbeat. So back in the day with The Source, it was Biggie, you know, that I, I put in unsigned hype or Common or DMX and unsigned hype, different things like that. Now, Don't Call Me White Girl, Funny Marco, these are people who you know, we're creators that we're doing their thing out there, you know, on social media, uh, different platforms, but that, you know, I saw like had potential to go to a whole nother level. We could create a podcast platform for them, you know, okay. um, you know, now I'm doing the same thing, Bubba Dub, uh, Trash, the, the new show I'm doing, Bubba Dub's Trash Talk. Everybody got to, got to check that out because uh, he's an incredible, you know, up and coming talent. You know, people love him, funny as hell, and he knows. Right. Is speak. that is that primarily sports content with him? Yeah, primarily. You know, comedy. Of course, you're gonna laugh. Sports focus for sure. You know, don't call me white girl. She talks about everything. Trapping Anonymous, another great show with uh, my man Chris Styles out in Brooklyn. Right. Uh, he's killing it with the interviews. Just bringing again, just you know, just just do you know the whole way these different again these different voices and different authentic stories um just trying to build a, a platform and then a place where we can all come together and kind of share ideas exchange ideas and uh, uh, the new one now uh with with suge is going to help take all of that you know to another level okay collect calls with suge knight tell me how that before we get to that tell me about your relationship with suge knight being as though um, he was Source Magazine. He was on the cover of Source with the red suit on, right? Was yeah, ninety six. Okay, what was your relationship like with with Big Suge back in the nineties? Um, I had a great relationship with Suge. Um, we always, you know, got along. I never had no no drama with him. Uh, right. You know, from the you know, we just did a lot of really important things that helped each other's growth in those years so like 90 uh what was it 92 uh, um you know when dr dre had left nwa and people were trying to figure out the world was trying to figure out you know where is he going to end up what's going on there was rumors about it you know he's making the chronic trying to get a, a deal starting death row uh, i got some advanced music had come my way i'm like this album is incredible. We got to get Dr. Dre on the cover. So I got to find this guy. I ended up having to track Suge down. That was the first time I met him. 
was to set up that classic cover with Dr. Dre with a gun to his head. Oh, okay, okay. Famous covers of The Source ever. And that also helped The Source in 91. Like That was like a huge newsstand selling magazine for us. So it kind of helped right. The Source with that. So, you know, I, I think of my relationship with Suge in terms of different magazine covers, the Snoop and Dre cover that came, you know, after that, then, you know, the Dog Pound cover, the Suge cover, the Pop cover, and then, of course, the Source Awards, you know, like, um, so, you know, obviously, he was a big, big part of the, the first televised Source Awards in, in 95. I don't even know why I asked that question. I forgot about all of that shit. Death Row was an integral part of the Source. The way that you described it, was you like surfing on a typhoon and shit back then? Like, that's what it sounded like. All of that star power, man, at your disposal. Like, was you just waiting on the next thing to happen? You mean as far as content, like for the magazine and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was a, it was an amazing time, man, because hip hop was just, it was still, you know, it was still a lot more raw. It was still more early in the development and, and the evolution you know, uh, uh, of the music and the culture. Um, you know, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have social media. So, you know, um, things took a little longer to get around, but um, uh, it was, yeah, I mean, it was so much incredible music being made in those years. That's, you know, that's the height of the golden era of hip hop, you know, really right. started with kind of Rakim, you know, that's, and, and Kara's one to me kind of, give birth to the golden era of hip hop, but then that spawns into what we saw in the early nineties, you know, both West coast, East coast. And of course, you know, then down South as well. Right. All right. Um, I, I listened to the first episode and he described you. He like, you know, my man, long time, 30 years and shit like that. Tell me, uh, how were y'all able to continue your relationship after what happened at the source awards? Um, like, did, did that did that make it awkward or anything? Anything? Tell me, please. No, no. I mean, that wasn't like a lot of people. You know, have a lot of. There's a lot of misconceptions about that night. You know, it's definitely one of the most, you know, memorable, important nights ever in the history of hip hop. But not necessarily for the reasons that a lot of people might believe, or that certain media outlets have tried to portray you know certain narratives about about that um so like i wasn't mad at him it didn't it didn't fuck anything there wasn't no fight nah, he didn't do anything like people made this oh you know like you know yeah it was a, a commotion and there was some tension or whatever but you know it got calmed down it was incredible you know energy in the room that night yeah right. some few people might have got a little nervous if that wasn't their thing, you know. And but other than that, like it was, it was a great night. So it wasn't like I was mad or anything. Uh, any any issue with him coming out of, out of that? You know, I talked right. to him. I talked to Puff. You know, that night and and and, and afterward, I had a relationship with everybody. That's the reason I was able to do the Source Awards was because I had cultivated these relationships with the Puffs. Right. Leors, the the Suge Knights, the Jay Princes, all, all the people that you know were the were the movers and shakers of hip hop throughout you know the country, and and got everybody on a sort of a chord to come together. Like you know, hey, we need to do this for us because you know back then we were you know hip hop was being disrespected you know everywhere. Like we didn't right. get so. Now, um, was that the first annual? Was that night? Was that the first annual? I, I was the second annual like event the one in 94 which wasn't televised was the first that was the one that Pac was at where you know he came out on stage performed out on bail interrupted tribe called quest yeah i was gonna ask you that <laughs> damn. Yeah. all right all right i ain't gonna go back to that but get, yeah damn that was never televised but i never knew that that was a source event that that happened that night yeah oh yeah that's the first source awards 94 i mean that was it that was i mean five thousand people in the paramount theater sold out everybody in, from hip-hop was there man it was so much that was a, really the first one it's sad that there's not enough video footage around there's bits and pieces of it but uh we didn't film it for tv but i think some of the footage that we did record got lost over the years or or, or whatnot but that was you know, that was really 
it that set it up for 95 uh to happen okay um did you that night just the last thing i asked you about this that's the source wars that night did you feel any tension did you know of any rivalry brewing between uh the two record companies no because there wasn't there was no i mean I, that's one of the things i i i've emphasize when people again have tried to twist the narrative about that that night it wasn't like there was some kind of beef going between them or anything like that there was not, nothing nobody knew that that Pac was going to get out of prison you know four or five six weeks afterward nobody knew that he was signing to death row so there was no affiliation known of death row and Pac because obviously Pac and Biggie and them had been going back and forth while Pac was in jail that whole year. But that didn't have anything to do with the people I brought together that night for the Source Awards, you know, including Death Row and Bad Boy. So that just that just popped up. You know, now my thing is, you know, a lot of people just try to blame Suge for, for whatever, whatever. But like to me, there was there was more to it. Like when you when you when you watch the show, uh, obviously Death Row opened that night with that medley and the jail cells and everybody coming out, you know, blew the doors off the, uh, the theater right at the gate. You know, Suge spent over a hundred thousand dollars to help, you know, to make that happen, which was, it was, was big. He was right. the only label executive that actually offered to pay for a custom set that night, um, which was, which was incredible. But if you keep watching the show, when when Bad Boy performs, you know, one thing that I don't think a lot of people pay attention to, Puff comes out at the beginning and he's kneeling on the stage by himself and it's like quiet. He's under the spotlight. He's kind of talking softly. But he says, you know, something, I live in the East and I'll die in the East. You know, like you go back and listen to that. Now, I'm, you know. Me and Sugar are going to talk, get into some of this stuff in, in, in the podcast for the first time. You know, he, he and I honestly never have had like a lot of conversations about that night. So I have my own ideas of, of what he was thinking. But I'm like, you know, if I'm sitting there, first of all, Sugar was there like 70 deep. You know, I did, you know, I knew that because because he spent so much money, you know, I gave him mad tickets. You know, he brought his home. So he, he was deeper than anybody else by far. You know, Puff might have had 20. 25 tickets but you know suge had 50 60 70 tickets and you know cash money whatever it wasn't cash money but you know whatever rap a lot might have had 15 and this label might have had but he was the the deepest in in there you know there was people from new york that were in the audience as well but i don't think suge felt any kind of nervousness like he was going to start some some shit up he felt he was more in control probably and i think he felt provoked but you have to tune in the Collect Call uh, podcast, and we're gonna definitely find out from Suge everything he was thinking that that night. Once, once and for all, set the record straight. When was when was the seed planted to launch the Collect Calls podcast? Um, well, I had spoken to him like a year, year and a half ago. Just some somebody had mentioned him to me, and I was like, "Oh man, I need to," you know see how he's doing, catch up with him. We got on the phone, we talked for a while, and I told him about Breakbeat and what I was doing, and it was kind of like, let's try to figure something out. Um, but earlier this year, like, you know, maybe six months ago, my fiance, um, her name is Brett Jeffries, and she uh, is also the chief creative officer for, for Breakbeat. So she's brought a lot of different ideas and things to the table in helping me build a network. She She kind of brought it up his name had come up and she was like, well, you know, he really seemed like he, he has so much respect for you and you guys really get along. Like, did you ever think about doing a podcast with him? And I was like, you know what? <laughs> that might be a really great idea. And uh, right. I, and, and we put it together from there. Okay. Have you received, you, you dropped the first episode on iTunes initially, right? On yeah. Apple, right? Podcast for people that don't know if you got an iPhone, there's a whole Apple Podcast app on your iPhone for free that has audio millions of audio podcasts you could be listening to. A lot of people people don't know that it's not iTunes, it's it's an Apple Podcast app. Of course, Spotify too. You can hear all the audio. But yeah, we dropped it on the audio platforms initially, and last night we just put uh, the visual uh, mm -hmm. out last night. Uh, give these uh, my viewers. The information on the channel. It's the channel that you on right now, right? 
Um, no, I'm just on calling from my phone or whatever. So I don't like the go to the Breakbeat Media um, YouTube. Oh man, am I frozen? Nah, you. Uh, I think you probably flipped your camera. Um, I press. Nah, what the Hold on, Dave. Dave, I'm going to send you another link. They stand in the comments that we're a little choppy. So I'm going to send you 